rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. You know, I chose to read this passage from the New Living Translation. I like when I'm reading scripture, especially preparing for a message, to read it in lots of different translations. I know Carolina does too. Because it each shed a little bit of light in, in, uh, in a different kind of way. Actually, I really love reading this passage in the paraphrase the message because it really kind of brings it into a, a modern way. Uh, so while I read it in the New Living Translation, it's a little easier um, to understand. I usually reference it uh, when we're talking to read youth in the New International Version for its conciseness. So then, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. The French philosopher Simone Weil wrote, to be, rooted, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. I was introduced to this quote while reading an article written by Sabrina Friesen. She's a counselor based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In her article titled, The Importance of Being Rooted, she shares how, as a counselor, she has seen many folks who wrestle with a sense of being unrooted, uprooted, or rooted in unfortunate places on a regular basis. She goes on to share how rootedness seems to be related to a sense of connection or belonging, the need to have to feel like we fit in, and the desire to identify as part of a group. It seems most of us have an innate desire to connect and belong somewhere. And that is no truer for any of us than for our teenagers, who are at such a crucial time in their lives. That season of life is usually the first time that a person begins thinking about who they are, what they're about, and how it may affect their life and future. Identity develops as teens try out different roles and attitudes in different settings, such as home, school, with friends, both in person and online. And these different influences allow teens the opportunity to explore themselves, their values, beliefs, personality traits, ethics, so on. So in this way, teenagers are seeking to establish themselves in a most critical way. The challenge being that our world is smaller than it's ever been. I know Carolyn has referenced this book before because she's also been reading it, The Anxious Generation. If you have children and teenagers in your life, you should read this book. Its author, Jonathan Haidt, scientifically lays out the facts of how smartphones, social media, and big tech have led to the collapse of youth mental health in what he calls the great rewiring of childhood. And I learned many new things while reading this book, but mostly it confirmed for me what I've seen taking place in the ministries I've been a part of over the last 20 years. With the world at their fingertips, there are more culturally significant influences vying for the attention of our young people than ever before. It's somewhat like the situation that Paul is addressing in this scripture passage from Colossians. There were cultural pressures tempting the believers 
and the Colossian church to turn away from Jesus. All these new Christians had grown up worshiping various Greek and Roman gods who governed different areas of everyday life. And some of the Colossians considered Jesus just as one more deity that they could worship alongside the others. From a different cultural group, the Jewish Christians were pressuring these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all the laws in the Torah. And together, these cultural influences were bombarding them with, as Paul puts it, empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense. In this passage, Paul is earnestly mentoring the young believers of the Colossian church in their faith. And he's saying, don't get distracted by made-up rules that people make. Just follow Jesus. Don't get distracted by the voices of others saying you're not good enough. Just focus on Jesus' voice. Don't get distracted by the way that you used to live. Focus on the new life that Jesus has given you. Because Paul wanted these new, new believers to know that everything they are and everything they're about begins with Jesus Christ and a new life in him. His advice to them in verses 6 and 7 is simple and straightforward. Let your roots grow down. Let your lives be built up. Grow in your faith. Be thankful. These simple and straightforward words serve as the vision for our youth ministry at Peru Baptist Church. As we serve the youth of our church and our community together, it is my hope, and I know the hope of the leaders who serve alongside me, that we would be creating and offering spaces where young people can become deeply rooted in their faith. Spaces where they can come to know Jesus and his great love for them. And as they come to know Jesus, we hope that they would let him shape their lives as they discover who they are and what they're about in him. That they would focus on him, putting aside the distractions that come with living in this small world and building their lives in his truth and his way. It's my hope that they would increasingly grow their faith through our ministry with them and to them. And as they grow, that we would provide opportunities to let their lives overflow with thankfulness, sharing the transformative love and care Jesus offered them to others in service and in ministry. This vision, though, doesn't exist and can't exist on its own. It must be part of a greater vision that we all have as part of this coronation for this season in our church's history. In the new year, Pastor Carol Ann and the deacons will be having uh, probably more than one retreat uh, to begin processing and identifying the vision of our church. I really hope that when that time comes, you will plan to take part. In the meantime, I have some homework for you to do because you all know that I'm much too practical to leave it at that. Your homework is this. Pray. Pray for the ministry of our church. Pray for what God is calling us to do. We know that God has done great things in this church in the past, and he's not done with us yet. For you, we need to pray for what he's doing now and in the future. Pray for our church leadership and for this vision process. Pray that we would grow. Pray for the courage to invite someone to come to church with you. As I said to the deacons just earlier this month, people rarely start going to church because God told them to. They usually start coming to church because somebody invited them. If that is hard for you, pray for the courage and opportunity to invite someone to come to church on Sunday morning. Pray for the young people in our community, in our congregation, and their families. Pray often, but pray, and pray as the Spirit leads you. Let us begin again now.
Heavenly Gracious Father, I thank you for the preparation of these words and the meditation of my heart and the ways that you, Lord, have led for this vision for our youth ministry in our church here and this community in this place for this time. But we know, Lord, that you have a great vision for this place. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us and pour yourself out upon us and lead us, Lord, in your way. That you would inspire us and give us courage and give us fresh eyes and fresh expressions of sharing your love, your transformative love, with the people around us. And Lord, we pray this for all ages, from the youngest uh, to the most senior, that you would move in our lives, Lord, in such a way that all might see. And wouldn't be able to help themselves from wanting to know more. And so Lord, we, we pray for our church, we pray for all that you're doing now and all that you have yet to do. And we commit ourselves in this way. We ask this now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going to stand for our last hymn of the day. Uh, number 588, we are called to be God's people. Thank you.